our Providence seminar tonight. This is about transportation matters. This is testing. This is testing. Are we all right now back there? We're fine. Okay. I'm Linda Smith, Providence Supervisor. For the last three years, we've been doing Providence seminars on various topics. Our last one this year was about Maryfield. This is our second one in this series, and this one is about transportation matters. As you all, I am sure, have been reading in the newspaper, the governor has finally put in place a transportation package that will be giving Northern Virginia some funding for doing those road projects and transit projects that we've been waiting for for a long time. Tonight, we have some of our county staff here to give you a brief review of that transportation package. We have Kathy Ictor and Tom Bashadney from our county staff. And when they're finished, we will be turning it over to our folks from the Virginia Department of Transportation. Dennis Morrison, I believe, is here. Yes. And the private company that will be working on the hot lanes Floor Transurban. And I believe we have Tim Young from Floor Transurban to go through the whole hot lanes project and to answer your questions about that. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Kathy Ictor to talk about the road package and the transit package fresh from the General Assembly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm actually going to turn this over to Tom Bishadney here in just a minute. I just wanted to introduce the subject a little bit. Uh, I've been director of the Department of Transportation for Fairfax County for just over a year now. And I have to say, with what finally happened in the legislature at this last session, I am far more optimistic than I have been, certainly in my year uh, as director, but even the, the five years leading up to it. The General Assembly this year, after we've been trying for about five years, did pass a bill that is going to bring what I would term real money to Northern Virginia. And in terms of real money, talking about if all of the taxes and fees are raised around $300 million a year, uh, they will go to MBTA, and then if the local jurisdictions want to raise some additional fees and, uh, to another $100 million, it could come to the region. So this is really good news in terms of actually moving some of the projects that have been on the drawing boards for many years. Um, I don't think it affects and they can address it, the hot lanes project on the Beltway, because that's coming from another source of funding. But in terms of freeing up many of the others, uh, this goes a long way. I next want to introduce Tom Bishadney. And what I wanted to tell you all, which, what you may not know, is that Fairfax County is extremely active in the General Assembly uh, when the session is in, is in session. Um, and we have three full-time staff people down there, um, someone from the county exec's office, someone from the county attorney's office, and then we have a representative just for transportation. And that person is Tom Bishadney, who I'm going to let talk to you about all the other things and the transportation bill that were passed. Uh, he is down in Richmond full-time during the legislative session. And in prior years, for I would say the last four years, a lot of what he's had to do is just play defense to make sure that monies didn't get taken away from Fairfax and Northern Virginia. This year, though, finally the offense worked and we were able to come home with a really major new bill. So with that, let me introduce Tom Bishotney, the Transportation Legislative Staff. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you to Supervisor Smith for having us here tonight. Um, I actually live in the Providence District, so uh, it's good to be here. Um, as Kathy mentioned, um, this year was uh, quite an interesting year in the General Assembly, and um, obviously transportation funding was a, a major issue, as it has been actually for a number of years, and some of this work takes um, many years to, to put together until everything falls into place, and fortunately this was a year for that. Um, before I talk about the transportation bill, though, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the other things that happened and didn't happen this year's General Assembly that do have some bearing on the Providence District. Uh, first of all, um, related to uh, photo enforcement of traffic lights, um, as you may know, 
Uh, there were, was authority for local governments, particularly here in Northern Virginia, to uh, have photo enforcement of traffic lights up through 2005. A number of local governments, Fairfax County, the town of Vienna, Falls Church, Fairfax City Hall, uh, had programs. Those programs ended in 2005 when the authority went away. Uh, we have been working to reinstate that, and, and this year the General Assembly did approve that. So um, that's that's good news for enforcement, uh, good news for safety, and um, that takes effect July 1st, 2007. So a number of the local governments will be working to reinstitute their federal red programs. There's a number of steps that have to be taken to do that. But I did want to let everybody know that since um, it will affect the area immediately right around the Providence District. And as Kent, Kathy mentioned, sometimes success at the General Assembly is coming home uh, and having prevented bad things from happening. And many times I've had to come home and do that. Uh, this year in particular, there were a number of bad things that were out there. Um, there were a number of people shooting at the Dulles Rail Project. And uh, Fairfax County, working with our partners, were successful in um, holding off and defeating some legislation that would have delayed the Dulles Rail Project. In addition, um, there was legislation that would have required the local governments to take over various portions of our secondary road program. And that would have shifted a burden that is currently a state burden for funding that to the local governments and to you as taxpayers. And so we were successful working with a very large group of partners to uh, defeat that legislation this year. Um, as, as Kathy mentioned, the biggest success really this year has been in transportation funding. And there's really two pieces of that. The first is in the, uh, the budget bill. And uh, well, normally there's uh, some money for transportation that falls out of the budget bill. This year there was about $500 million that uh, was allocated as part of the budget for transportation. This is above and beyond the normal funds that we would get for transportation. And um, this is important because of that amount, $305 million was allocated to a group of six projects. And while it wasn't specifically allocated to those six projects, two of them are here in Northern Virginia. One of them you're going to hear more about this evening, and that is the Beltway Hotlands project. The other is uh, Route 50 west of Route 28 in Fairfax and Loudoun County, a widening project there. So what the General Assembly did was set aside this $305 million so that um, there would be funding to provide money for those two particular projects as well as four others around the state. And so that's good news for those projects. In addition, there was some, uh, there were earmarks for both Metro and VRE, about $60 million total for transit. Uh, 20 million for Metro and 15 for VRE for rail cars. So uh, that's also obviously an important issue here in the Providence District with uh, the number of rail stations existing and more to come. Um, moving on though to the really the, the big transportation bill, what's known as House Bill 3202. And that bill had a couple different pieces to it. It had a statewide revenue package, it had a Northern Virginia revenue package, and then it had a variety of other ancillary issues that directly or indirectly relate to transportation. I'm really going to talk mostly about the funding pieces and what that might mean here in Northern Virginia and uh, touch just a little bit on some of those other pieces and we'll take some questions. Um, <clears throat> on a statewide basis, um, there were a number of additional revenues that have been put towards transportation. Uh, the first is um, 67 million per year in general fund dollars that are going to be allocated, directed to transportation. This is existing revenue, taxes you're already paying, that will be uh, allocated to transportation. Uh, and that comes from the recordation tax, and that's the tax that you pay when you um, refinance your house or when you buy a new house. Uh, in addition, the bill requires that two-thirds of the general fund surplus be dedicated to transportation in the future. That's an average of about 96 million per year. Uh, one third of the insurance premium taxes that are paid here in Virginia, including those taxes that are paid on your auto insurance premiums, are now going to be dedicated back to transportation. Uh, for the last five years, they've been put into transportation on a year by year basis, but now going forward, those will be dedicated to transportation. Uh, there's an um, increase in the sales tax on diesel fuel. 
So it will now be equal to the sales tax you pay for your automobile fuel. Uh, that goes from 16 cents per gallon to 17.5 cents per gallon. An increase in the registration fee of $10 per year. That's for your auto registration. Uh, increase in fees for heavyweight trucks or overweight trucks. And then a new fee um, called the abusive driver fee. And this fee is a fee that will be charged to anybody who accumulates eight or more demerit points or is guilty of certain fairly serious violations such as DWI. This is a new fee. It's only being used two other states right now, New Jersey and Texas, and, um, and it will generate about $65 million a year estimated. Um, where does all that money go? On a statewide basis, $200 million of that money is going to go back into the VDOT maintenance um, program. And you wonder, well, why is that important? Well, first of all, maintenance is the number one responsibility for VDOT, maintaining the current system. And right now, they're running a deficit of about $450 million per year in their maintenance program. So what VDOT does is they dip into the construction program, pull that money out, and fully fund the maintenance program. And Various people will say, well, even that doesn't do all the maintenance we really like to see VDOT do, but that, that meets their requirements for their program. So by putting $200 million into the maintenance program, it frees up $200 million for new construction. Some of that will be here in Northern Virginia, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, in addition, the statewide bill, those revenues pay the debt service on $3 billion in new transportation bonds that will be issued over the next 10 years. And those will be allocated around the state. 20% will be allocated to transit, which is a good thing. Northern Virginia gets about 70% of the transit money in the state. 4.3% uh, will be allocated to rail, and 85.7% will be allocated to highways. Uh, this will allow for transit funding to be increased to a, a, an additional $45 million per year. And, um, to talk about what does that mean here in Northern Virginia? What are the specifics here? Well, one of the things VDOT was able to do, and they have just put out last week, is a six-year program that incorporates some of these new revenues. One of the things they're able to do is to fund the cost increases on projects. For example, right here in the Providence District is a 29 gallons project. It's been on the books for decades. And that project, due to the delays that have occurred over the years has increased in cost, just simply due to the delays. Land is more expensive, road materials are more expensive. In the past, VDOT would have come back to the county and say, well, the costs have gone up, and so we're going to have to delay the project because we don't have enough money. Well, this year, because of those new transportation funds, they were able to keep that project on the schedule. So that's definitely a good thing. Um, in addition to that, there are projects that were taken off the plan a number of years ago when there wasn't money available, those are starting to come back on the plan. Uh, an important one here in the Providence District was the I-66-495 interchange. Back about year 2000, there was about $100 million that was put on that project. Um, over the years, the money has been taken off the project just because it needed to be allocated to existing projects. This year, um, VDOT is putting about 40 to 45 million back onto the project, so that's good. That will help to eliminate the bottleneck there. We still need some more money for it, but it is a step in the right direction. In addition to that, um, maybe more dramatic is the impact on the county's secondary road program. And these are all the roads that aren't major roads like Route 7 or Route 123. Um, these go down to subdivision streets, but are also some of the um, some of the more larger roads that, that don't reach to the same level as Route 7. And in this particular area, uh, Spring Hill Road is one of the roads that's in the secondary road program. Um, back five years ago, the secondary road program was $129 million over six years. Last year, the program the board had to approve dropped that six-year program down to $52 million, so almost two-thirds reduction over a five-year period. This year, with the additional transportation money, that program will go back up to $119 million over the six-year period. So it's not where we need to be. It's not back where we were. But it is definitely a significant increase over the $52 million we have. And we'll also increase the transit match ratio from 30 below 30%, actually, to about 50%. So the state will be paying 
about 50% of the cost of transit improvements. And so that's also a good thing. On the Northern Virginia side, the General Assembly, as part of this bill, allocated some revenue to Northern Virginia, or allocated basically authority, really, to Northern Virginia to raise up to seven local taxes yeah. to raise about $300 million, as Kathy indicated, per year here in Northern Virginia. Um, those are those seven, and I'll go down quickly, um, uh, is an increase in the rental car tax, 2%, increase in the grand tours tax of 40 cents per hundred, and this is the tax that's paid when a person sells property. Um, they would pay an additional 40 cents per hundred dollars um, for the, uh, from the sale of the property. Increase in the hotel tax of 2%, increase uh, in our addition of sales tax on the labor that you pay associated with auto repairs, and that's 5%. An, an initial registration fee of 1%, so any vehicle that's registered in Northern Virginia for the first time would pay a 1% on the cost of that vehicle. So if somebody's moving in from out of the state or even out of the region, they'll pay it. If somebody buys a new car here in Northern Virginia, they'll pay it as part of that. Uh, and then that's it. You only pay that one time. Um, and then there's an increase in the safety inspection fee that we all pay annually of $10 and an increase in the regional registration fee of $10. Uh, in addition to that, well, let me talk about that for a second. The Northern Virginia Transportation Authority has the option of raising all seven of those taxes or none of those taxes. And so they will be um, considering that over the next uh, couple months to make a decision on which of those taxes they would like to uh, implement. And I'll talk about that a little bit in the end. In addition, um, the local governments were given the authority to raise a commercial real estate tax, uh, which could go up to 25 cents per hundred dollars evaluation. Um, if it's raised at 10 cents in all nine of the local governments, and they implemented a local registration fee of $10, that would raise about $100 million a year. So if jurisdictions went higher than 10 cents, it would raise more money. Um, in addition to that, there is provisions to um, allow local governments to institute some impact fees on, on residential development. And there's not really an estimate for that because it's not determined which jurisdictions would do that and how they would actually go about doing that. So how does this Northern Virginia money, this uh, $330 million, uh, get spent? 40% of that goes right back to the local governments. And those local governments have the choice of, or they have to use 50% of it on those secondary roads that I talked about earlier. And the rest of the money they could also use on secondary roads. They could use it on roads that are in the long range plan, so primaries uh, and even interstates. Uh, or, or they could use it for transit. So there's a uh, considerable amount of flexibility how that fund, those funds can be used. Uh, the funds that NBTA has, that's the remaining 60%, they first have to pay off any debt service on any bonds that they might issue. And then $50 million a year goes to Metro, $25 million a year goes to VRE. Metro money can be used for capital, so rail cars, um, buses, things like that, um, station improvements. The, um, the money for VRE can be used either for capital or for operating. And then the remainder of the funding is spent on projects that are in the long range plan, which is um, called Transaction 2030, and it's a plan that NBTA approved about two years ago, and it outlines improvements for the region uh, between now and 2030. Um, so what is NBTA doing right now? Um, NBTA, just, just to give you a brief update of who M NBTA is, it's made up of the nine local governments here in Northern Virginia, including Fairfax County. It also has two representatives from the governor, three representatives of the General Assembly, and then um, the represent, uh, representative from VDOT and the Department of Rail and Public Transportation. And NBTA has established five different working groups, one on legal, financial, project implementation, organizational, and public outreach. Basically take that organization, which has been around for five years now, they haven't had a lot of money to spend, but they did the, the long range plan, and now they want to take that organization from basically a planning organization to a funding organization to raise some revenue and then channel that into 
most likely existing organizations, local governments, um, regional agencies, potentially state government, to implement projects. MBTA may also hire some contractors or general engineering consultants to implement some of those projects themselves. And uh, they have charged those five working groups with coming back on June 6, which is two weeks from tomorrow, uh, with uh, recommendations on how they should proceed in each of those five different areas, basically setting up for MBTA to take some action in July. Um, I can't tell you right now what action MBTA will take, but um, they are moving forward to try and implement the bill to uh, try and bring additional transportation revenues here to Northern Virginia. As I mentioned, there were a couple other provisions in the bill. Um, there were some provisions related to land use and quote, linking land use and transportation more closely. There were also some VDOT reforms that were included in the bill. And we'll go through those in detail unless there's questions. But um, at this point, why don't I just stop and see if anybody um, has questions and, and try and get into a little discussion of the bill. Yes, in the back. group of people that probably can provide you a much better answer on that than I can. So if you wouldn't mind um, until the next presentation. Okay. Other questions? Sir. Given that the project was just added back in, uh, at this point the schedule hasn't been set and will have to be coordinated with the Hotlines project. The, the work that Tom was referring to is primarily the work on the approach coming in on 66 as opposed to the Capitol Beltway part of it. So I know part of what had been looked at was like widening out under the Gallows Road Bridge and some things like that. But at this point we don't have a schedule, but that will be set up here shortly. The, the only project at this point that has funding is right at the interchange as you approach the Beltway. Uh, largely what's going to be done within existing right-of-way. So, I mean, that's something that as the plans are developed, we'll have the answers, but we don't at this point. Yes? understanding is it's in addition. What was the question? The question was, uh, Tom had made the statement that there was $45 million in the, the six-year program that was just published. As a matter of fact, there's a public hearing tomorrow night on it at the government, Fairfax County Government Center at 7 p.m. for anybody that's interested. Um, but that program now includes approximately $45 million for the interchange at 66 and 495. This is separate from the Hot Lanes project. That's what the question was. Was it part of the Hot Lights project or separate? Are there other questions about either what happened to Richmond this year or? Yes, sir. What authority? Excuse me, I don't know your name, sir. Tom Bishad, I think it's his name. I don't know. I'm trying to find out the authority that DDOC has versus the authority that the governor's office has. There's how much of what we have decide is predicated by what the legislature tells them to do, and how much of what they decide can be decided by the governor and his executive? Well, um, VDOT is actually um, reports to the, um, the governor, but they also report to the Commonwealth Transportation Board. And uh, the, question, the question was, what authority does VDOT have what authority does the governor have? And um, the, the Secretary of Transportation reports to the governor, and the Commissioner of VDOT 
reports not only to the government, to the Secretary of Transportation, but he also reports to the Commonwealth Transportation Board. The members of the Commonwealth Transportation Board are appointed by the governor. So ultimately, um, the reporting goes back to the governor. I don't so know if that, does that answer your question? So does anything that he not do or not do ultimately comes back to the governor? The governor, the buck stops at his table. I think you could probably say that. Okay, thank you. Now, Dennis Morrison from VDOT is here, and if he wants to correct me, uh, what the gentleman said was that ultimately the buck stops at the governor's desk. And uh, if Dennis, would you like to add anything to that? No, I'm Okay. I asked that question because you said uh, sentences that started with VDOT decided or VDOT did this, or, and it just seemed to me that it reflected my experience with them, which is of terrible arrogance desire to do things on their own without reference to the desires of the citizens whatsoever. Okay, well let me let me clarify. What I was referring to was the plan, the six-year program that VDOT released last Wednesday, and VDOT has the responsibility for releasing that plan, preparing that plan. As Kathy mentioned, there'll be a public hearing next tomorrow night at the Fairfax County Governor Government Center at 7 o'clock for the Commonwealth Transportation Board, who ultimately must approve the six-year plan uh, to get input from citizens. And there will be a number of citizens there with a variety of comments, I'm sure. Uh, that input will be taken into account, and ultimately this Commonwealth Transportation Board will approve the plan. So I didn't mean to um, indicate that VDOT was, was imposing things. They don't have that authority. Ultimately, it goes to the Commonwealth Transportation Board. Other questions? Yes, sir. Well, there has been a number of rumblings that there. Uh, the question was that the gentleman understands that there has been a legal challenge, and will that affect implementing the bill? Um, there have been a number of rumblings that there might be legal challenges, but as to date, there are no legal challenges. So. NBTA is looking at potential strategies for how they might address any legal challenges. And um, obviously, if there are challenges, those will have to be dealt with. Um, there is confidence, though, that the, the bill can withstand the legal challenges. Yes, sir. So far as the uh, roads, the access roads, um, looks like there's points like the highway gallows, as far as it impacts the secondary roads, is that funding or how do you have it separated out between the funds that are for the secondary road program versus the roads for the access points that then will go into the hot lanes? Okay, um, I assumed you were talking about the hot lanes, which they will get into, but the, the hot lanes project strictly speaks to the facility on which the hot lanes going to be built, which in this case is the Capitol Beltway or 95. Now they will have to replace bridges and some of those things which help in the future of the secondary roads leading to them. But uh, the secondary roads have to be funded out of a separate pot of money. So, some of them are secondaries such as Braddock Road, Gallows Road, um, and then others are primaries such as 7, 50, 123. So, uh, both secondaries and primaries have different pots of money that we have to fund out of. However, this new money that can come to Northern Virginia and that will be coming through for the state will certainly be used, uh, be applied to those types of roads, secondaries and, and primaries. Um, and particularly, I think the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority money will be looking at applying it to major regionally significant roadways, such as the ones I listed that tap into the Beltway. Question over here. I have two quick questions. One is, I would like to hear about the link of land use with transportation. The second question is, is there a time frame when NVTA has to make a decision about what taxes or what they're going to be doing taxes, i.e., will this be made before the election in November? I don't think that there is a required time frame. However, they're moving toward trying to do that this summer. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sorry to see the first question was about the, the link between. Land use and transportation. Right, now let, let Tom handle that one. 
Okay, we could spend a whole meeting just on that, so I'm going to be very brief. I've already got my high sign from Supervisor Smith, so we'll be uh, very brief. Um, what the bill included, I mentioned earlier, it does include the provisions for uh, allowing for impact fees, both transportation impact fees and impact fees, more general impact fees that would uh, include things like public safety and schools and things like that. It is done in a very fairly narrow way, though. County staff is looking at those impact fee provisions to see whether or not they would have applicability here in the county and how they, the county might implement those. There are also provisions for um, adopting um, urban development areas, and those areas um, are required. Uh, each county must have at least one, and Fairfax would probably have more than one, that uh, require that development be concentrated in those areas and that. Um, really funding for public services being focused in those urban development areas as opposed to the areas outside. And then lastly, um, there are um, urban transportation service districts, and those would allow local governments who wanted to to take over the maintenance of their roadways, and um, they would also um, basically be allowed to charge impact fees on areas outside of those urban transportation service districts. So that's a very brief thumbnail. Like I said, we could spend a lot of time on those provisions. Uh, with that, I thank you very much, um, Supervisor Smith. Also, I just mentioned I'm going to hang around for the rest of the meeting. So if anybody has any follow-up questions, I'll be here. Tom has to head to another meeting, but um, I will be here. Thank you, Tom and Kathy. Right now, I'd like to introduce Dennis Morrison, the head of VDOC in Northern Virginia. Dennis, hot wings. Thank you, Ms. Smith. <clears throat> Good evening, and thank you, Ms. Smith. Uh, can you hear me? I'm Dennis Morrison. I'm the district administrator for VDOC. Uh, and I'm here to talk about hot lanes. I'm going to talk about all the hot lanes, the 395 and 95, but we're going to focus in on the Beltway. We're also going to talk a little bit about transportation management plan for the six mega projects that have the potential to be built here in, in, in sometime in the near future. So we wanted to take a holistic look at how, tra how to manage traffic if all these projects become go to construction. Uh, kind of an icebreaker for me, how many people here in the last week have been on the Beltway either during the morning peak or the afternoon peak, would you raise your hand? Okay. How many people here have been on 95, 395 and the morning peak or the afternoon peak? Would you raise your hand, please? Okay. That gives me a feeling of, you know the area, you know the traffic, you know the situation we're in. I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, and, and one thing I, will, I want, you to know from the state of Virginia and from a VDOT standpoint, from my personal standpoint, uh, the HOV lanes on 95-395 move more people than any other system we have. And I'm talking buses and rail and you're just talking people moving in just under one quarter. It's been so successful here. And, and the state of Virginia needs to make sure that the HOV stays in HOV. And I just wanted to let you know that because I, I know there may be some issues here about that. Uh, we have a short PowerPoint presentation uh, and I'm going to be doing that. And I'm going to get out of the way here. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? I'm going to introduce some team members. Technology, I really do. <laughs> All right, tonight's presentation, I'd like to introduce the team, the VDOT team, uh, the project manager for the Beltway, and he was only a temporary manager because we're in the process of filling a manager, uh, was Roger Booth. He, he was called out tonight and he couldn't be here, so I apologize for that. Larry Cloyd's a project manager. Larry, could you stand up? Raise your hand. Larry's project manager for the 395-95 project. John Muse, John, would you stand up, please? 
John's our environmental manager at the Northern Virginia District, so if we have any environmental questions or any issues, he, he'll be our expert tonight. Thank you, John. Uh, Debbie, would you stand up? Debbie's our right from our right-of-way section in the, in the Northern Virginia District. And if we have any questions about right-of-way, she's going to be here to talk about our processes or any questions you may have about that. Again, I'm Dennis Morris. I'd like to introduce Mitch Lester. Mitch, would you stand up, raise your hand? Mitch is uh, with the Floor Transurban team, and he will lead the construction effort. So take a good look at Mitch. So when we're out there, when we do get a project, we don't have a project yet. If we do have a project, he'll be the one building it. Mitch has brought along several members of his team, which including Vince Dolan. Vince? We have Sharon Gookin. Sharon? Thank you. Bob Portley? Bob? Thanks, Bob. And Jeff Wagner. And Jeff is the technology expert here also, so if you have any technology questions. From Transurban, I want you to introduce Tim Young. And with Tim is Tony Adams. Tony? And Tony has an Australian accent, so if you get a chance, you need to stop by and talk to Tony. And Jennifer Ahmed. Jennifer? Okay. Um, let's go. go to the next. Let me go back. Uh, I'm going to talk about high occupancy toll and hot lanes. I'm going to talk some about their benefits. I'm going to talk about the Capitol Belt, Beltway HOV bus hot lanes project. I'm going to talk some about moving forward, including preparing for construction. I talked to you a little bit about the transportation management plan. I'll try to go faster if you get a little bit. <laughs> uh, Public-private partnership, delivering a vital transportation improvement sooner than traditional funding. You just heard uh, Tom talk about the funding situation for Northern Virginia. We did not have the money to move forward with expanding the 95-395 corridor or the Beltway corridor without going through a public-private partnership. So from a Virginia Department of Transportation, uh, we're the state agency. We own the roadway. It's a public roadway. We will be uh, oversight for construction and operations. <coughs> We will do the environmental reviews. We will make sure that safety and design standards are met. Floor Transurban team, their private partners with the state, their publicly owned engineering construction company, firm, their toll road developer, they're an, an investor and an operator. They're going to be, brought, be providing the funds for construction, operations, and maintenance of the hot lanes and bus lanes. They're going to be the builder. They're going to be the long-term operator. They're going to be doing the on, ongoing routine maintenance and incident response. This is just an oversight to give you a picture of what's going on when you look at the 395, 95, and the Beltway. Regional, we're looking at a regional aspect of it. The hot lane proposals for the 395, 95, and the Beltway is going to add 70 HOV bus hot lanes more than we have today. Going to be 56 miles from I-95, 395, and 14 miles on the Beltway. It expands the regional HOV system, which again has been very successful in this region. Provides congestion relief and new choices. It's going to create free-flowing network for buses, and that's very, very, very important. If we're going to encourage people to use buses, they need to have a roadway that's free of congestion that they can use. It connects 95, 395 with the Capitol Beltway, I-66 and the Dulles Toll Road. 
So with now, I'm going to turn it over to Tim, and he's going to talk about uh, what are hot links. Hello everyone, uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Uh, my name is Tim Young, I work for Transurban USA Development. I'd first like to stop and uh, say thanks to Supervisor Smith for the opportunity for our companies, ourselves, Floor, Lane, to come here tonight. And I also want to thank you all for coming out and spending your Tuesday evening uh, with us. Uh, we all do this from time to time in our own neighborhoods. Uh, it's, 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 it's a chore to get out at times and we appreciate that, and giving us the opportunity to talk a little bit. We want to talk and start with, you know, the concept. And I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about it, and then we're going to get back with Dennis. But what are hot links? There's a few descriptive words up here, and we'll just kind of take them one at a time. The first one is really, what does the hot stand for? High occupancy tolls. Okay, that's great. What does that mean? That's the way I read it. These are lanes that are used, being used by high occupancy vehicles and lanes that are being used by vehicles paying a toll. Currently, there are no HOVs on the Capitol Beltway. This is an opportunity, and as Dennis mentioned also the bus network, an opportunity to bring those to the Capitol Beltway, just like they have on I-95 and 395. And those folks will use this road for free, as will buses, van pools, and of course, emergency vehicles. And as you'll see, we'll come to the diagrams, and certainly as you walk around the room, the toll, the toll roads will be right next to the general purpose lanes, the regular lanes. Let's try another definition of what hot lanes are. Let's go down toward the bottom. Congestion-free lanes would provide new choices for motorists, carpoolers, and bus users. Very interesting congestion-free roads in Northern Virginia. That's going to be a, a magic trick. Well, how are we going to do that? We're going to do that by using something called congestion pricing. That's bullet up there, to maintain free flow conditions. Congestion pricing, it's actually quite simple. It uses the concept of supply and demand. And that supply and demand to, to manage the, the flow of traffic. Let me give you an example. During the peak hour of the day, as traffic begins to build, the toll rate will increase. And it will increase until there is the desired level of traffic in those lanes. The toll rates on this road will vary by hour, by time of day, and by day of week. And that is how we will manage free flow conditions. Choices. New choices. Again, this is the first time HOVers bus service will be, be uh, afforded the opportunity to, to uh, run a, a pretty competitive and reliable service on the Capitol Beltway. But what about other people using the roads? Let's talk about that. As an individual, you may choose to use the roads because you got to hit that late night meeting with that client from California but you still want to get home to see your seven-year-old play the softball game. You might choose to use the toll road, pay a toll, because you're running a little bit late and you got to get home to the daycare center before they start charging you those overtime rates. You may charge, you choose to, for the first time, address this issue by collecting some of your colleagues up in Tyson's Corner and forming a van pool or a carpool. Again, you will ride the, uh, the road for free. So those are the choices we're talking about. And of course, ultimately, if you do none of those, you can still run, use the regular lanes for free. Let's see if I can work this. I'm 
going to get into how these toll lanes work in a moment. Um, again, it's about choices, new choices for, for people who want to use the buses, use HOV lanes. We've talked about using the toll price to regulate the traffic. But the next slide I'm going to get into really kind of describes what you're going to see when you get out there. This is not the toll road that we are all used to seeing across America. This is going to be 100% fully electronic bullet point easy pass. Those of you that travel up and down the East Coast potentially see some of these things. I know it's on a New Jersey turnpike. Uh, other places you still need to slow down, but there's going to be no slowing down. You're going to go under what we call a gantry. That gantry is going to read the tag and on you go. No slowing down, no stopping. There's going to be uh, a significant number of electronic signs placed up and down the corridor to provide you the information you need to make the choices. You're going to know what that price is before you get on that road. And you can make the decision then and there. And you'll have plenty of time to make that decision. And you'll have time to get off should the, 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 the rate change as you go forward. And the last bullet point is probably one of the most important. So please don't let the fact that it's at the bottom of the paper you otherwise and that's all about safety and enforcement you'll hear from our colleagues at VDOT how important safety is and it's equally important to floor lane and transurban what we're going to provide on this road is a level of monitoring and surveillance that will go hand in hand with a very comprehensive incident uh, response management plan that surveillance will allow us and monitoring will allow us to make the right decision and to make that decision very quickly and get our crews out to people in need very, very quickly. In addition, I know it's sometimes hard to believe, but there are people that might want to bend the rules in this fine country of ours. There will be a significant amount of effort put into enforcement. There will be a, a dedicated officers looking to enforce uh, on this road. If anyone is familiar with the enforcement problems on the I-95, 395 road, uh, that is a serious consideration. And if we're going to get up in front of you all and talk about uh, congestion-free lanes and reliable trips and, and telling you how you can get home to see your family after a tough day of work uh, when you need to be there in a pinch, uh, we need to make sure the enforcement does work. I have touched on the, uh, 
the shifting of the demographics and the jobs out of Washington, D.C. into Northern Virginia. This place is an economic, uh, it, 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 it's, it's the economic vitality, it's just a growth machine. The congestion is a huge problem. If we don't do something about the congestion, that machine's gonna slow down. This is one transportation tool that is being looked at nationwide as a way to do that. And this is an opportunity to support the continued growth in the area. And it's smart growth. It's an opportunity for people to get out of their cars, into a bus, uh, into a van pool, uh, potentially continue to use the general purpose lanes if they like, or to even use the toll road to pay the toll. The point, the last bullet point says it all. These lanes will help you out of traffic and onto the more important things of life. I'm gonna go through a couple of quick graphics and turn it back over to Dennis. Uh, you see in uh, stereo, that's probably a better picture. It's a little bit shady up here, but again, our two lanes uh, in each direction, so four new lanes all together, will be right next to the general purpose lanes. They'll be separated in the middle, right along the 495 sign there, by a barrier, concrete barrier, and between the hot lanes and the general purpose lanes in both directions, they'll be separated by pylons. And of course, there's the shoulders on either side. And this, of course, and again, if you've had a chance to walk around the room, you've seen it. You've certainly had a chance to, to talk to some folks about what, what you see here. But this is the project. Two hot lanes in both directions, total four, 14 miles in the Springfield Interchange up to the Dulles Toll Road. I will emphasize once again, first time HOV bus service van pools will be able to access a reliable road and again it will be for free. Uh, what we've talked about new if you've had a chance to walk around you talk about the new and improved sound walls looking to reduce any impact on the local neighborhoods and the last is probably one of the most important and that's replacement of aging infrastructure. Hard to believe or maybe not but this is the first major improvement on the Capitol Beltway in 30 years. In total, this project will be upgrading or replacing 42 bridges and overpasses. So 30 years in, in the making, and this is what we're bringing to the table. Um, so I, I think, it's, again, it's, it's all about providing convenience, first of its kind for the HOVers, and the buses, the bus service, which will be very important piece, just as it is today on 995. So with that, I thank you, and I'll turn it back over to Dennis. Thank you, Tim. All right. Um, moving forward, I wanted to talk about uh, the partnership agreement in place. I want to talk a little bit about that. We have an interim agreement. We do not have a final agreement. We're still working through those details. More than six years of public input been on this project, the Beltway. Design work's underway. But we're doing intensive construction planning. It's not going to be easy to widen the Beltway for 95 and 395 under traffic. So it won't be easy. It does take intensive planning to do that. Coordination with the county, Fairfax County, and local landowners on the final design. Construction expected to begin in spring of 2008, pending a final agreement between the partners and the state. So we're going to have a lot of construction going on. And let's, let me just name a couple projects. We have the 395-95 under construction. We have the Beltway under construction. You got the Dulles Rail Project to be under construction. You got BRAC with the Fairfax County Parkway to be under construction. We have the fourth lane widening on 95 going to be under construction. A lot of construction work. So how do you deal with the traffic? How do you handle that? Well, from lessons learned from Springfield and the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, 
you have to have a thought out transportation management plan. We have a single dedicated oversight team that's going to be looking at all the projects. There's got to be coordination between the Beltway and the Dulles Rail, between the Beltway 95, 395. We're going to have, gives us an opportunity to consolidate our resources. It's modeled after the Springfield Woodrow Wilson Bridge. Single convenient source of information for the public. Our goal is a safe traveling environment. Minimize disruption. There will be no lane closures during rush hours and major holidays. And the maximum awareness and use of commuter options. Communication, communication, communication. Vital. Conclusion, hot lanes are an innovative solution. General Assembly gave the state an opportunity to get involved in PPTAs. They saw this as a way to get transportation dollars invested by private industry. It's going to bring new choices, congestion relief. By going through a PPTA, we were able, will be able to deliver this improvements faster than the traditional methods of design, build, bid. Design, bid, build, when you have the dollars. Project team and VDOT are focused on keeping traffic moving during construction. There will be a coordinated effort. Um, what I'd like to do now, we brought a team of people here I've been trying to think through this. I know. Stand up first. The lady in the blue dress. Dress? Blue, blue, I'm sorry. Blue shirt. <laughs> Do you have an idea of what the range of tolls will be? Tim, the question is for the group, do we know what the range of tolls will be? And I'm going to let Tim, Tim, could you come up here and, and work with me on this? Uh, I'll take a first shot at it. Uh, no, I'm just going to let Tim answer that question. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, there, there's an awful lot of work to be done. Uh, it's it's uh, a lot of work to be done on the tolling. But right now, our expectation is that we would be ranging somewhere between a dime and a dollar uh, per mile, if you will. That's the range. And again, it's all predicated on the, the level of traffic, the time of day, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, uh, I'm going to go get a lot. Uh, I think this gentleman had his hands up, so I'm... Right, the, the, the question is, how are you going to determine if you have a single person in a car or a car that qualifies for HOV and to be free? Is that... Wait a minute. No, that's not the question. Okay. And that's a great question. We get that a lot. Uh, I will tell you right now that there is a lot of research ongoing on, on that detection right now, uh, and we are part of that. We have a number of solutions that we are evaluating right now. Uh, obviously, we need to work those through, but there's some time to do that. But right now, the opportunity, and that's really where the enforcement is key, and that's one of, the, one of the options is the enforcement we focus entirely on uh, occupancy. Did he answer your question? Yes, except that how about one person there? How many charges are there? If you're HOV, if you have a 3-plus in your car, you will not be charged at all. Uh, again, it's electronic. Under that base, under the base system with the officers, for instance, if he were to, if, if he go through a gantry, and there is no tag, and it doesn't doesn't signal that you had a tag, the police officer is going to be signal that you went through without a tag. He's going to look at that car, and he's going to find out. Uh, they'll know when when you get stopped. That's correct. 
And, and that's that's what we do now on HOV. For, for, for 395 and 95, that is state, state police controls that. Yes, ma'am. You know, there, there are a lot of options on the tags, and I will tell you from our perspective, what we are focused on is being as convenient as possible. If you're going to use the toll roads and pay a toll, you're going to have to have a tag, easy pass. But we need to work out a solution for the HO, HOV folks, and that'll be a, a function of the technology available, available at the time. You know, and again, we're out in 2013, 2014 when this, this facility will be operating. A lot will change. But that's that's really it's predicated on as much convenience as possible for the user. And, and, and we'll follow up because we, I know we're going to get a lot of questions. Let's don't get beaten down to one thing. But just let me make one comment. We have to learn to get away from taking money, coins. It's very expensive. It's very time consuming, and we have to make a major investment to do that. So if there's another way of doing it, we need to learn how to do that. So let's go to some more questions. Oh, man. <laughs> in the back, the, the gentleman with this with this, uh, paper in his hand. I have a question. The uh, construction schedule, how, what percentage is going to happen at night? What kind of times so we can plan our lives around this uh, construction? All right. The, the, the question is, what's a construction? construction schedule and I'm gonna let Tim talk about that we're going to give you the full term and maybe he can he can also identify different phases of it. Uh, they don't let me near the construction I'm not allowed to use the big machines either what I'm going to ask if you would that group back there right behind you uh, very capable answering those kind of questions so I'm not dodging the question by any means I'm just not the guy to be answering those I know not to ask, not to give you any more construction questions. All right, uh, the gentleman in the uh, shirt there with, with, yes, sunglasses. Yes, sir. Is the proposed schedule for the 95395 similar in terms of when it would start? Do what, sir? Uh, Uh, the uh, and Larry, you may have to help me with this one, but let me let me take a shot at it. For the 395.95, for the first 28 mile section where we already have an HOV facility, that's going to start sooner than the second part where we have to go through a whole environmental process, whole design, and work through a lot of issues. On the portion that's past. Uh, what is it, Prince William Parkway? Is that where the HOV ends? For that section south, we're going to, it may take three years to go through the environmental process and all the public meetings and all the things that we have to do. For the, for the one above that, we're looking at either 2000, late 2008, Larry? Late 2008 to begin construction on that. Thank you for the question. Yes, sir. Yeah, question. Uh, where else has floor not over? Yeah, the question was all, where has Transurban and Floor done this type of transaction before? Um, I will not speak on behalf of Floor, um, but I will tell you that they are uh, world renowned for their expertise in this area, um, but certainly they can talk to that. Uh, with regard to Transurban, Transurban has uh, a number of roads currently being operated in Australia, and uh, we're currently looking at a number of, of uh, other opportunities throughout the United States. Uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, this is a, um, a very hot topic. Um, there's a lot of people looking at it as a solution uh, to the congestion, so. Sure. That is correct. There are a number of, of, of hot lanes. Yeah, and we do own a toll road. Uh, it isn't a hot lane per se. It's just not congestion pricing uh, down in Richmond, the Pocahontas Parkway. There's a lot of hands, so you're going to have to bear with me. And I see a couple of gentlemen who've spoken a lot at uh, different meetings. So let me try to get some others, and I'll come back to y'all because I know you got some comments. But let me get the gentleman back to the left here. Why does the state of Virginia 
Okay, that's a, that's a very great question, and I'm going to try to answer it in a short answer, and it's not going to make everybody. I mean, you can go on and follow that and follow that and follow that, but let me just let me let me tell a few things. We're going to have to. Th this area is growing so fast, and we're going to have to look at all modes to manage transportation. I agree. I definitely agree with that. But we're adding like a city of Lynchburg every year to this area. I think we've got to do things differently. We've got to figure out ways to move many, many people the fastest, best way we can. Now, the hot lanes just got in into, just got placed into the long range plan for the region. It has benefits. Now, you may not agree that it's the best solution, but it has benefits with buses and getting people to drive free on the road into a car. You may not agree with all that, and you may want to, let's do more metro and let's do more metro. I don't disagree with that, but that costs dollars too, and that's the best I can answer that question right now, and I can't go any farther than that. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And I also Let me make sure I, I get the question right. The, the, as I heard the question, and help me with this, is we're at an interim agreement. We don't have a final agreement, and I caught the end. When are we going to have a final agreement? And then you also said a couple of comments about the longer we wait, the more it's going to cost. Very likely. That's, that's true. Is that, is that the question? Yeah. OK. Uh, th that's absolutely true. Uh, we've been working with the transurban floor team for a while now. It's not like we're just starting. I mean, we've been looking at plans and plans and plans and talking about issues and issues on how we're going to maintain it, how we're going to have access points, where the access points are going to be, what effect will the access points have on the other traffic lanes that it's tying into. We have we have spent, I just can't tell you how many hours looking at that. We've looked at, call, we're looking at costs. When we get this final design down, that's when we go into the negotiations on what, what it's going to cost, what's the best deal for the state of Virginia that we can get going through this. Is it a fair agreement? Is it, will it work? Will it work? And that will go on we have a group we have a team that goes through that 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 negotiates that team with floor that that agreement and i'm not sure when that will be finalized um, it may be it may be three months before that's finalized it may be a little longer Can I just have a follow -up, though? at some point don't you find yourself over a barrel when construction is ready to be no, I don't think so. I don't think we would want to have a final. We wouldn't want to sign agreement unless we were confident that we had a good project. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned access points, and I noted tonight and also previously that at certain points along the route, we can access this from one direction to another. Correct? Yes, ma'am. should answer that question. Vince, Vince, come up here. Brad, let's just answer this one question. Vince, come up here. Oh, is this going to be a long answer? Vince, the question is the number of access points, and, and I don't want to drag this out because we got all these people here. 
that can answer some detailed questions, but you ask the uh, question. All right, here's a question so everybody hears it. There's access points on the Beltway. You know, we have some north, we have some south entrances and some north, and we've got different entrances at different points. She's looked at that and made some comments that some of the access points are on the less traveled way. Less busy, less, busy, less traveled. How, how would you answer that question? And talk real loud. I'll try to talk very loud. Can, I guess, Kathy, if you, if you can hear me. In, as, as Dennis mentioned, we went through developing the projects, put a lot of time into this, and through the strategic model that comes from MW Cog, we looked at the various traffic pageant patterns in the region. Now, and we've developed these entrance and exit points based on the traffic patterns, where people are, where the growth is, and where people are coming from, where they want to go to. However, there are some places where we couldn't actually put the access into because it would totally confound the interchange, one of those being Route 50. At Route 50, you all know that's a very busy interchange, very congested, and if we tried to put more in there, it would just make the matters worse. Thank you. Uh, boys, got, got a lot of good okay. questions. Who had, I, I see one that had not had quite, I'll get to you, the, the lady in the back here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, actually, my question is a follow-up to the question that was just asked about what's coming with the highway. With the existing traffic patterns, does that take into account all the work that's being done in Merrifield? Because that's going to change the traffic patterns. You're not, a, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And then now you're not going to be able to get on the highway to Merrifield because of all the traffic that's going to be coming with the south lanes. At least, I mean, I, it seems like I wonder if that's taken, if taken into account. Vince, did you just shake your hand yes or no? Did you take into account the development that's planned in the Maryville area? We actually took into account all the development in the, in the entire region. So what actually goes into is the long-term growth pattern all the way out to 2030. So all the development that's planned for the entire region is considered in people's traffic patterns, as well as those things which VDOT has planned in their, in their uh, transportation improvement plan. The agreement will be written in a way that if we needed to add additional lanes or additional access points, we would have to work, the state would have to work through the partnership and build that. But that would, would not prevent us from being able to do that. But we'd have to work with the county, and we'd have to work with the state to make that happen. But, those are, I mean, all right, but this is our plan today, okay? All right. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to interrupt. No, I can't. You're just going to have to move around and follow me. I'm a nervous guy. No, sir, I'm sorry. I can't. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I'm not uh, going to. All right. You want to have free access. Next to question. To Next question. Over here, please, Before you take over again, would you please have the other people from VDOT come forward so that I'm not trying to move all over the place so that the people can hear what they actually have to say? There's only one microphone, and you have it. All right. Here's the deal. I'm going to try to not move around, make this gentleman's job easier, but we're not going, you know, we're trying to do the best we can, so I apologize with the red. I was, I was just sitting here thinking maybe we could tie into your website. You already do. And what we just introduced, introduced uh, I believe, early, late last week, early last week, is uh, virginiahotlanes.com. And that is a, I think I can use the word joint, uh, cooperative effort between ourselves as the private sector and VDOT. And that will be the place to get as much information as you possibly can stand. 
uh, and it will be updated on a very regular basis. Thank you for the question and the suggestion. Uh, the blue shirt. Yes, sir. You, sir. That's a real issue for us. The bridge is an issue. Uh, going north past Dulles is an issue. Uh, that's something that we, we're not going to fix that problem with this hot lane proposal, but that may be something we're going to have to look at in, in, in the future. Uh, well, if you look at all the movements, that's one of the movements that, uh, that we didn't want to put in there because of uh, the, uh, uh, that movement, because it's so, it's, it's so congested. But we recognize that point. Thank you. Uh, OK, I see these two gentlemen have been waiting anxiously and smiling and ready to ask some tough questions. So go right ahead, sir. I'm Kerry Campbell. Uh, I have a simple yes or no question. Is spending on the bridge going to be a tax dollar on deadly tolls going to cut dependence on foreign oil and make it safer and more secure? Okay. The the Beltway hot lane, lanes and the 395-95 hot lanes will be a safer roadway. Yes. But the oil, I'm not sure. The oil, I'm not sure. Yes, sir. The answer is no. So, so, in other words, it only be able to get on it Correct. Correct. And it will make that safer. Slip lanes would make it unsafe. Yes. What assurance do I have that the HOV won't go up to four instead of three? Yeah. There is no assurances. There is no assurances. Uh, there is no assurances. I don't know what else to say that. But the HOV three has been so successful. And when we had HOV four before, it just didn't work. Didn't work. But HOV three has been very successful. That's an issue we're going to have to deal with down the road. Who will make that decision? You are the the Commonwealth Transportation Board will make that decision. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, sir. And if you've asked a question more than once and somebody hasn't asked a question, I'm going to go that direction. You know, I don't have the details with me, but I, I know about that, so let me, I'll give it my best shot. There will be expanded bikeways and pathways that, that doesn't exist today. Wait a minute, let me finish. There's going to be more than you have today. Bikeways and pedestrian crosswalks. Crossing bridges. There's going to be more than you have today. Is, it, is there one now at Route 7? There will be one at Route 7. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, they are. They're, they're on our plans. I don't know if they're on the diagrams here, but they have been identified. So I'll let somebody in the back of the room answer the part about the uh, uh, sound walls. Do you want to take a shot at the, uh... you want me to answer that one? <laughs> All right, and, and your question again is about, oh man, hybrids. Hybrids is, um, 
and we haven't finished with hybrids yet, so there hasn't been a final decision. Uh, I don't want to answer this. Uh, hybrids are a good thing. They're a good thing. <laughs> On our HOV system, hybrids are taking more and more of the capacity on our HOV system. Let me just talk about today. They're taking more capacity on our HOV system. My personal, this is my personal opinion, and everybody else got a different opinion. I think when you have three to a car, instead of one to a car, even if it's a hybrid, that I'm not sure that that one car with three people in it, instead of having three cars with one person in each car, if there's better environmental than having one hybrid. But that's, that's a whole other issue. Our, our, what we're trying to do is get more people in one vehicle to use the roadway. As hybrids grow, and I think you're gonna see more and more hybrids, what are we gonna do? Because we have a capacity issue. We also have an environmental issue. And where do you get that balance? I don't know. But if everybody, if they made a car it got 100 miles to a gallon, and let's just say it was pretty much small free, and we wanted to put them all on the road, we would have a capacity issue. It's going to be a really tough problem to solve. Uh, the EPA has just came out with a new ruling or a draft ruling. I haven't had a chance to dial to get into the details on that. Uh, right now, there hadn't been a decision. I thought they were leaning not to allow hybrids to drive on the roadway free, but that decision has not been made. And I apologize for making such a long answer to that question. Motorcycles will not be able to ride that free. We're still into the discussions on that. All right, this gentleman hadn't asked a question yet. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear the total question. I say. Right, right. That that will be in the final agreement. We'll have to work through that issue. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to stand right here. <laughs> I just wanted to, just to reemphasize, there is a solution that does work, and that's the physical enforcement by the law, by the you know Virginia State Police. That's what BDOT currently uses, and that is one option we're looking at. So there is not a scenario whereby we can't do some level of enforcement. The question for us is the efficiency and the cost of that type of enforcement versus some of the technology that is being developed and is being brought to the marketplace and needs to be demonstrated, but you know, we're committed to, to making, making the investment in that research to bring it to the marketplace so that we can have a very effective enforcement regime. Uh, right, well, there's obviously a lot of things that need to be negotiated in the contract, but uh, uh, you know, from our perspective, the fact that we can enforce is a, a, a it has an impact on on the operation and the efficiency and it's again people using the roads that are going to continue to to clog things up as we're seeing on i-95 currently uh, we're going to take two more questions and i know roger's going to be one of them but hang on two more questions then we're going to be in the back of the room we will be here till we answer all your questions but we're only going to take two more questions and Roger, you're going to be the last one, all right? And we're going to let this lady ask the question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. Roger, last question. She just made a comment. She didn't ask me a question. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I guess kind of my question is, you know, the decision? No, no, it's not my decision. Well, That's, I mean, what if they, for, for example, what if they come in and say, well, because of these extra crossings, because of gas pressure, because of these other things, we don't have to pay It's going to be more costly than we thought from early and now. The governor has not put any pressure on VDOT to do that at all, that I know of, and I won't be the one negotiating it. There's a team, there's a team that's going to be making a recommendation to the commissioner who will be working with the Secretary of Transportation of, to make that decision for the state of Virginia. A team, so, yeah. So it's the Secretary of Transportation? It, it, it's a commissioner working with the, with, with the Secretary of Transportation. That, that's all the questions we're going to have. We got, we got in the back of the room. Please, please, please use the people we have. We have some experts here. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate your time.